Will you pray with me? Almighty God, as we worship this morning, we pray that you will bring many of our young people home safely and that the word that they've heard over this weekend will settle into their hearts and grow their relationship with you. We pray for Jackie and her family as they are celebrating the life of her mother. God, we pray for all who are not able to be with us this day, for any struggling with health or grief or fear or any oppression that would make them unable. God, we invite your deliverance to touch their lives and ours as well. Give us ears to hear your word this morning, eyes to see your people, hearts moved in the places where your heart is moved, and fix in us a readiness to serve as you call us. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our spirits be pleasing in your sight, God, for you are our rock, you are our deliverer. Amen. Throughout this winter, we have been considering what it is to be those who are imagio dei, those who are made in the image of God. And in order to do that, we've been considering who is God, that we would be made in his image. We celebrated last week from the creation stories how God breathed life into human lungs and today we remember that God not only gives us life, but longs that we would have life to the fullness, an abundance of life. We are created, each and every one of us, all the children in God's world, created to be whole beings in the image of our creator, free and well in mind and body and spirit. Last week in the Genesis story, we remembered that we were created, us humans, and called really good. And then in about 15 minutes, us humans, us good ones, uh, we took the one apple that God asked us not to eat. And so we saw how brokenness of relationship between God and humanity and God and or humanity and creation was disrupted in, in us disobeying and us taking more than our share. Today, we turn the page from Genesis to Exodus, and we see how this goodness, the goodness in us, the fullness of life in us, is corrupted by selfishness. And how that disrupts not only our relationship with God and with creation, but at times our relationship with each other with human beings, with people like us and unlike us. It can be disruptive. Exodus, which you heard a long reading from, tells us the stories of the Israelites who were held captive in Egypt and then them being led to freedom by God. But before we can get to those crystalline freedom stories, we have to remember where it begins. Exodus begins in chapter 1. A new king, we're told, has taken over Egypt. He did not know Joseph. He said to the people, look, the Israelite people are more numerous and more powerful than we. Come let us deal shrewdly with them or they will increase and in the event of war, join our enemies and fight against us. So Exodus begins by telling us the new king doesn't remember the shared story. Some of you might know the shared story. The, share, the story of Joseph tells us that our God of deliverance saved both the Israelites and the Egyptians from a common famine. Through Joseph, an Israelite who came to be first a slave and then a ruler in Egypt, through that one man, Joseph, God saved the Israelites and the Egyptians. So all the people living in Egypt, whether they were Egyptian by origin or Israelite by origin, they had all shared the same moment where God provided for them to not starve to death. But the new king? The new king has forgotten how the Israelites got there. The new king has forgotten how they were all saved by the same God. And so the new king is looking at the Israelites with paranoid eyes. 
and saying, these people are so numerous that if we let them continue to live freely in our land, they will become more than we are. They will take over our homeland, and it will be forever changed. This is an old story, but it's not old at all. This is the story of every age as we look at who we are and who others are, particularly if we forget our common stories of deliverance, our common creator, our common deliverer. And so the king establishes this harsh slavery that we read about. The Egyptians become ruthless in imposing tasks on the Israelites. They make their life bitter and hard. I have Egyptian family. We have some Egyptian worshipers. And so I'm, I'm sensitive to this story. I think it, it speaks to all of us having ancestors that were both the oppressor and the oppressed. When I went to Egypt with my family, my family is part Muslim, part Jew, and part Christian. It's really fun at holidays. It's really complicated. But we went together in, in this kind of multi-religious experience, and we went and we stood in front of the pyramids, because that's what you do. They're awesome. A celebration of, of engineering. And you also stand in front of the pyramids and you grieve all the monuments that have been built by the powerful on the backs of those who suffer. Every land has such monuments. The selfishness of the human condition can and often does inflict injustice and bondage. The Exodus story cries out good news and discomfort at the same time. We are introduced into the mix of this context, this place where there is suffering and injustice to the God who is deliverer. We find that God is not far removed, nor indifferent to suffering or injustice. God introduces himself to Moses. Most of you are kind of familiar with this story. This is the burning bush. Matthew has a story that has about 20 stories in it in his bedtime book, and we get to the burning bush at least once a month. The bush is on fire, but it's not consumed. The Lord is introducing himself to Moses. The Lord says, I have observed the misery of my people in Egypt. The Lord says, I see you. Whatever is oppressing you, Whatever is making it hard to thrive, let God introduce God's self to you this morning. God says, I see you. I see you. I have heard the cries on account of their taskmasters. God is saying to Moses, and I think to all of us, I hear your cries. Now what's really important for us to realize here, Reverend Dr. Bruce Birch pointed it out in a Bible study I'm a part of. He said, notice that God hears their cry. It doesn't say their prayer. Now, we believe assuredly that God hears our prayers. When we say, God, in your mercy, help me, God hears that. But here in this passage, it simply says, they heard their cry. Sometimes, friends, we are crying, and we're not sure who we're crying to. The Egyptians had been in slavery long enough that they were just crying. We don't even know if, if they had enough faith to pray anymore because they had waited so long and wondered so hard, where is our God? So even if you're not so sure where you are with God in this moment, know that God hears you when you cry. And it goes on. God says to Moses, indeed, I know their sufferings. We've been talking about this Hebrew word to know. It doesn't mean I know in my head. It doesn't mean I could figure out that formula. It is to know, like in our gut. Like a mother hurts if her child hurts, or a father grieves if his son grieves. It's, it's a knowing that, that takes over our soul. God says, I know their sufferings. For whatever reason that you are struggling or suffering this morning, the word from God to Moses and us is, I know all about it. To the extent that, that God would let himself feel it with you. 
I know their sufferings, God says to Moses, and I have come down to deliver them. God sees you, God hears you, God knows you, and God is coming to deliver you. And not just you, but every human one made in God's image. God is a God of seeing, hearing, knowing, and action. This is a good news of our God of deliverance. God says to Moses, so go and assemble the, Israel, the elders of Israel and say to them, the Lord, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham and Isaac and of Jacob has appeared to me. God is saying, this isn't my first time to show up. This isn't the first time I've heard or seen or felt. This isn't my first time to act. Remember what I did for Abraham and Jacob. I show up all the time. In every generation, somehow I intervene on behalf of the suffering. God says, I have given heed to you and to what has been done to you in Egypt. I declare that I will bring you up out of the misery of Egypt. God says, I'm going to lift you up. I'm going to bring you out of whatever is trapping you, whatever is enslaving you. And not just you, but everybody Reverend Bruce Birch reminds us that deliverance is not singular. We cannot deceive ourselves, he writes, into believing that deliverance is only physical or only spiritual. Deliverance is of the whole person to freedom. We have a friend in the Tuesday Bible study. I was picking on her at 930. Um, she's one of those saints that when she talks, you just want to be quiet because she just offers such wisdom. And she said, generally the church gets it wrong. And she says, either you find a church that really focuses on spiritual deliverance, a church that can preach the gospel and, and really lets us know that we need to be set free from sin and death. We need to be delivered from evil into a life with God. We need to be delivered from our fear of death into our hope of eternity. She said, these are good things, but it's not all. She says, or you find a church that talks social gospel, that only talks about being set free from hunger or being set free from oppression, from political systems that, that hold you down. She says, I come to this church, and I would say she's a Methodist because those two go hand in hand. Because deliverance must be at the same time spiritual and physical. Our spiritual deliverance sets us free to know that we are beloved of God, empowers us to live without shame and guilt as whole people, so that we can be a part of the physical deliverance that God is hoping to break through in our lives and the lives of others. When we look at Jesus, we find through the totality of his ministry this partnering of physical and spiritual freedom. The spirit of the Lord is upon me, Jesus says, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. Good news. I have a new preacher, don't I? I have five sons, so this is a fun exercise. <laughs> I'll have her preach. <laughs> Jesus says, let's find it. God has sent me. He's claiming Isaiah's passage. God has sent me to proclaim release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. It's not just physical or just spiritual. The two go hand in hand that our freedom from sin, our freedom from fear of death, our freedom from shame releases us to be those who are empowered to set many free. In his encounter with the woman, Jesus appeared to a woman with a spirit that had crippled her for 18 years. I read this passage carefully. We don't know what was going on with that woman. What we know is there was something in her life that was crushing her down for 18 years, that was keeping her from being able to, to live. That could have been an addiction that she was struggling with. It could have been a relationship that was, was 
keeping her from thriving. It could have been mental health. It could have been physical health. So many things that were keeping her from thriving. We don't know what it was, and I love that about the Gospels because it allows us to kind of insert there whatever would threaten to rob us from thriving. And Jesus, Saul sees her, Jesus hears her and says, woman, you are set free from your ailment. You are set free from your ailment. Then he laid hands on her and immediately, what did she do? She stood up straight. This is deliverance. Whatever about your life situation, whatever about how you sit here that would cause you to just be bent down, Jesus, the deliverer, wants to make you whole so that you can stand up and live in relationship with him. Now, here's the flip side of the passage. We all want to be delivered, but deliverance can make the comfortable uncomfortable. But the leader of the synagogue, this is supposed to make all of us religious people go, oh no, he's going to go there again. But the leader of the synagogue, indignant, indignant, because Jesus had cured on the Sabbath, kept saying to the crowd, there are six days on which work should be done. Come on those days and be cured, not on the Sabbath day. But the Lord Jesus said, you hypocrite, does not each of you on the Sabbath untie your donkey and let it go to water? And ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, who Satan bound for 18 long years, shouldn't be, she be set free from bondage on the Sabbath? Jesus is all the time having to confront people who become uncomfortable with what is required to set other people free. It confronts our religious sensibilities. It confronts our political associations. It just frankly makes us uncomfortable sometimes. How do we hear the promise of deliverance? It depends on our vantage point to oppression. However you're bent down today, maybe it's physical health. Cry out, Lord, heal me. Maybe it's grief. Lord, comfort me. It might be a long road, but God is getting us there. It might be mental health, and so we say, Lord, deliver us. It's a journey we share with the Lord, but the Lord can restore us to wholeness. It might be addiction, and we can break free with God's strength. It might be a sin that just keeps on bringing us down and breaking us with shame. God can set us free. It might be a socioeconomic reality. We have a generation of 20-somethings, and there are many that are much older than that, who work full-time and can't afford to live in the hometown where they grew up. Now, I'm working with them. Many of you are. How do we create a society where they can work, David's over there like, preach it, sister, right? You can put your hands up and say hallelujah once in a while, right? How do we create a society where those who work can live? Whatever has you crying for deliverance, go ahead and cry. God hears you and sees you and is about the work of deliverance. But sometimes it's our vantage point, too. If you're feeling a little uncomfortable, it's probably because you are seeing or hearing or feeling in your gut some nudge to do something about it. Deliverance is a journey shared by the Lord and the liberated, and it is a long road to deliverance that just doesn't ever happen without sacrifice. It says in 1 Peter, I'm missing the chapter there, we'll find it. When Jesus was abused, he did not return abuse. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but he entrusted himself to the one who judges justly. He himself bore our sins on the body of the cross so that free from sin we might live for righteousness. By his wounds we are healed. The suffering of Jesus, Jesus' willingness to suffer on our behalf allows us to hear him say, Father, forgive them allows us to be delivered from our sin, completely forgiven, and delivered from our fear to death, for in death and resurrection he has set us free. But our deliverance did not come without a cost. Deliverance never comes 
without a cost. So what's God's strategy for deliverance among us imagio dei, made in the image of God kind of people? Well, I call Exodus 3 the great switch. God says, I came, come down to deliver them from the Egyptians. Fast forward to the end. So come, Moses, I send you to Pharaoh to bring my people out of Egypt. And every Moses in the house, myself and, and all of you, say, wait, God, you said you were coming down. Like, we're cool with, you know, God lead us by a fiery pillar or a, a, a cloud. We are thrilled about God's intervention on our behalf. But God said to Moses, I'm coming to set these people free from bondage, and I'm sending you to do it. And that's just how God works in every land and every people, that God will act out of God's initiative. But most of the time, it takes people who have skin in the game for deliverance to actually be experienced. All of us, I believe, are called to see and hear and feel and act when we witness injustice. A few of you will be called to be leaders of movements. A few of you will be the John Wesleys in the world. John Wesley looked at the workers who were dying because their working conditions were so harmful, and he advocated to the workers to have safe work environments. That's where Methodism comes from. Freedom, deliverance, spiritual and physical. Some of you will be the prophets who confront political and religious systems. You will be the Martin Luther Kings who use your voice and give much to change the world. Some of you will be the person, some of you are the people who are in power and have the courage to act and change things. Some of you will make resistance or action your life work. You'll be the Harriet Tubmans that lead people towards deliverance. When I watch you looking at those pictures, I can see most of you saying, probably not. <laughs> there are a couple in this room who already do this, a couple in this room who are called to do this. Let it be your life's work. But I think all of us are called to be the midwives of deliverance. If not the prophets, if not the, the great known leaders, the behind-the-scenes people, for Moses to get to the burning bush, five women had to save his life. His mother had to give birth to him and hide him away for three months. Two midwives who were told by Pharaoh to crush him at birth rejected authority to save his life. His little sister stood by him as he bobbed around in the Nile watching him and Pharaoh's own daughter brought him home to be her child. Five women were the midwives of Moses' deliverance so that Moses could deliver a nation. We don't have to do grand things. We don't have to get our names in the newspaper. We just have to notice when we have an opportunity to save somebody, when we have an opportunity to help somebody thrive, when we have a nudge of a call to do something that makes life better, freer, more complete. We serve a God whose work is deliverance. So whatever is causing you to be bent down, cry out, God deliver me, set me free. And then look around because deliverance is for the oppressed, the oppressor, and the indifferent. Deliverance is for all of us. The aim is that every one of us will be restored to the imagio dei, the image of the God who created us, and all of us live in freedom to thrive. I love watching the way you all assist in delivering God's people. Amen.